The concept of reboot has become increasingly common among Hollywood productions as of late, and one of the most hot topic -y of recent memory is, well, this one. Directed by a then virtually unknown Mark Webb, who had only really done the indie drama film 500 Days of Summer, nobody really knew what direction they could go in. Would it follow the same grand, fun, adventurous scope of the Raimi films? Or would it try and stick closer to its source material and investigate some of the less pleasant aspects of the Spider-Man mythology? Would it rehash villains from the original series? Or would it bring in new ones and try out different concepts and approaches to the story? Would it go back and do the symbiote story again, but this time actually without any of the silliness of part three? Nobody knew at the time, and well, there was a lot riding on this. And let's not forget, Zony had the double pressure of not letting the rights slip back to Marvel and Disney. So they had to make a film within a certain amount of time, otherwise, whoop, there the rights go, and there goes one of their biggest cash cows. Now, I've already voiced my sentiments about this film a handful of times before, but I decided to go over it again just for clarity's sake, and also to bring up a couple of points I may not have mentioned beforehand. Especially with regards to what I feel this film did better over the Raimi original. Peter's character is one that hits me right off the bat as being superior. Firstly, Andrew Garfield actually emotes and actually feels like a real teenager. I've met plenty of people who behave like Garfield. I have yet to meet a single kid out there who even remotely acts like Maguire did. I've met people who are socially awkward or quiet, but they sure aren't Tobey Maguire. Secondly, the film obeys the age-old rule, which is show, don't tell. We actually see Parker doing science stuff. He does research, he builds his own equipment, and actually studies his condition, and does all sorts of other things. That stuff actually is relevant throughout the entire story. It's not just there so he can have a cute gag at the opening like the Raimi original. Plus, his intellect also gives him a savvy quality, as demonstrated with the stuff with Connors when he takes his father's formula over there to him in order to start hopefully getting answers. He wants to gain Connor's trust and dig deeper into what happened. Because think about it, a scientist like Connor's isn't going to take some kid seriously if he doesn't exactly hold his weight as someone with a scientific mind. And especially if he wants to prove to Connor's that he is Richard Parker's son, he has to demonstrate it in some way, shape or form. He actually does investigating, something that the Parker from the Raimi trilogies never did. Most of the time there, he just moped around or just sat around. Here, he's actively trying to look for answers. This is a sign of Peter's proactivity and his determination to get to the bottom of what happened, making him not only a more interesting character, as well as a more believable one, but also making him a lot more like his comic book counterpart, who actually did investigative work. He was by no means a detective of Batman or Sherlock Holmesian abilities, but he used what was on hand and he got on with it. So that's huge points already up there. Moving along to the next key component, the relationship between Gwen and Peter and how I feel it trumps what Maguire and Dunst were in the original. Here the romance plays out much more like an actual teenage romance. They talk awkwardly at first, but at the very least, we see their relationship progress throughout the movie. She stands by him and even helps him during the bow with the lizard. And they gain a relationship of equals by the end. And I really enjoy the dynamic between these two. Stone and Garfield have a great playful chemistry. And as for Gwen herself, she's a lot stronger, more proactive than most of your summer movie action females. She's not just some screaming, airheaded damsel for Peter to save. Here throughout, as I mentioned, she actually helps him combat the lizard and actually takes proactive steps in her own right to help out. Such as doing all she can at Oscorp to help delay the lizard until Peter can get there and combat him. Or helping to create a cure for the lizard's formula using her knowledge of the facilities available there. In fact, on the note of Oscorp, let's get to one of the big complaints that most people have with the movie, and something that I am definitely very split on myself. The Lizard. While I do agree that the character wasn't as well refined as he could have been, 
the character definitely suffers a downward spiral after the second act. At first he seems like a very noble and sincere guy. He genuinely cares about his work and sees what he's doing as beneficial to those less fortunate. And when he first takes the serum and his arm grows back, it's a genuinely touching moment. You can see in his eyes just how much this means to him. And just what this can mean for other people who have lost limbs or body parts over the years. Of course, once the serum starts to malfunction, then we end up with a more generic monster mad scientist kind of trope here with the whole, I want to take over the city and create this perfect race of lizard people. Who are without any sort of fault and can regenerate and all this other stuff that is undeniably a little bit on the lanky side. I don't think that the film is entirely without that middle bit. It's a little undercooked but at the very least we see Connor monologuing to himself about how he sees lizards as perfection and sees their regenerative capabilities. And in turn plans to utilize that to create what he perceives, or at least his warped mind perceives, as perfection. And at the very least, there is that consistency on his idea of wanting to just create a newer and better life, however warped it may be. It won't give Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2 a run for his money necessarily, but at least it's better than Goblin in Part 1, as I discussed in the previous video. Now there are a couple of other little things I could probably go on about, like for example James Horner's score, the same man behind Avatar and Titanic's music, which I actually think all things considered is pretty good. It's not as overtly big bombastic Americana as Danny Elfman's, but here it sort of has a more haunting ambience to it. And I really like the opening track, it gives this film sort of an uneasy mysterious quality to it. But it doesn't just straight up sound like any sort of regurgitation of what Newton Howard and Zimmer composed for the Dark Knight trilogy, which is what certain superhero scores as of late tend to sound like. And there are even some really fun action cues here and there, like the music during the crane sequence is really, really good. And probably one of the most distinctive things Horner has composed in a good long while, given that he is a composer noted for a bit of repetition here and there. And if you don't know what I mean, well, go listen to the Braveheart score and then chalk up how many times you hear the wedding music used again and again in other films he scored. But let's get to the real heart here, the actual story of the film. And of course also addressing a small controversy surrounding the film, which though I don't think is as big a deal as people make it out to be, I think there is an instance where it is really noticeable and it's an absolute pain. Aside from increased proactivity and relevance of traits to the actual characters, I also like the fact that this story actually incorporates more of the science-y aspect, something that is actually a regular feature of the comics. And it's not just here just so we can have a quick way to set up our hero and our villain's powers. That investigative quality of the film is what I feel really makes the film shine, and it also gives it an extra layer that we often don't see in a lot of big summer movies. Plus, some people have complained about the whole untold story aspect of the film and that it's not in it enough to really make it worth mentioning in the marketing. But the thing is, the marketing says the untold story begins, not here is the untold story. And if you look up in interviews and things, Webb and the team behind the film said this was going to be a story told over multiple films. So I actually don't mind it, and it actually makes sense. Plus, it's not like it's just there for five minutes and then it's dropped on like half the things in co op script for the first Spider-Man film. Here, that whole element of Peter's parents is what actually gets the ball rolling and starts up the chain of events in this story. It's what leads to the Lizard's creation. It's what leads to Peter's powers. It's what leads to... Uncle Ben's death, it's what leads into a whole lot of things as a byproduct of this formula being uncovered and what that will entail, and apparently from the trailers for the sequel, a lot of that is going to come into play, especially since now Osborne is going to have more of a face in that film. And we will even get to see some of Richard Parker's research facilities and equipment. And as for Uncle Ben's death in and of itself, I actually like how this version sort of plays it off as more direct consequence. It isn't as operatic as how the Raimi film put it. 
I mean, granted, it helps that this film hasn't had a sequel that completely retcons the original killer and thus makes Peter's choice in the first film completely irrelevant as he wouldn't have stopped Uncle Ben's killer regardless. But also because it actually is directly Peter's fault and his sort of arrogance and brashness that leads to Uncle Ben's ultimate death. Plus, Uncle Ben is actually practicing his whole philosophy as he dies. He actually goes out of his way to stop the robber from stealing from the store and actually trying to do some good in his neighborhood when other people are just content to stand by. The Uncle Ben of the Raimi trilogy more talked about that, not to say he was an unlikable person or that he just sat around and did nothing, but here we get to see a more direct realization of that philosophy and how it directly impacts Peter. Now as with regards to Sony's meddling with the film and supposedly all their editing of it, Really, the only time I actually noticed this was during the big 3D swinging scene that was advertised in all the trailers, which is seen from Spider-Man's point of view. Wow, oh wow, is it butchered in the film. In the trailer, it's full, it's flowing, you see him crossing a couple of rooftops and then jumping down. In the film, it's a quick series of cuts. It's like a super short montage, and I have no idea whose idea that was, because that's your money sequence. That's part of the reason why people pay to see your movie, was to feel like they were Spider-Man swinging through the air. Why would you chop that up? That's like charging people to go on a roller coaster, but it doesn't actually work. But, all my bantering aside, I think that The Amazing Spider-Man does a lot of really good things, and a lot of the right steps towards making it its own series, and not just a glorified rehash of Raimi's. Is the Raimi trilogy more fun in a sort of Saturday afternoon kind of way? Yeah, it is. Is the action much more grandiose and sweeping? Yeah, in fact, if there was anything I could genuinely complain about beyond some of the Lizard's development, it is that, well, a lot of the action in the first half feels rather small and contained. And it isn't until the last half hour that we really get the big, sweeping Spider-Man swinging type of action that you would expect. However, I think in terms of the core content, in terms of the story, I think Amazing trumps it. But that's not to say that the Raimi films don't have their own quality. And the fact is, we have yet to see the full pudding. We still have to wait for parts two and three. Fingers crossed for Amazing Spider-Man 2, guys. Fingers crossed.